are two Turing machines equivalent? In other words, do they accept the same language? It turns out this question is undecidable, and in this video we'll both give a proof that this problem is undecidable and talk a little bit about the implications for this result. As always, we express problems in the form of languages. And so here is the theorem itself expressed as a language. Um, the language is the equivalence of Turing machines and the language is undecidable. So given the description of two Turing machines, do they accept the same set of strings? Is the language described by M1 the same as the language described by M2? That's the definition of equivalence of Turing machines. And this language is undecidable. Given two Turing machines, you could start running them in parallel and try all possible inputs. And if you ever found uh, an input that uh, was accepted by one and rejected by another, you might uh, have, you would have proof that they're not equivalent. But if every string is accepted or uh, and you can't find any that are uh, rejected, uh, then uh, you might go on forever. So that's why this language is undecidable. In plain English, what is this theorem saying? Well, remember we've talked about the Church-Turing thesis that the idea of a Turing machine accurately captures the idea of an algorithm. Given two programs or two algorithms, you cannot compare them to see whether they will do the same thing. In general, any algorithm to compare two programs uh, might not itself terminate. Any correct algorithm to compare the functionality of two programs will sometimes fail to halt. The problem is undecidable. In some cases, you may be able to quickly determine that two programs are different. And in some cases, you may be able to prove that they really are the same. Uh, for example, if you're given two Turing machines uh, and each Turing machine and the two Turing machines are exactly identical, the descriptions are uh, character by character identical to each other, then I think you could see quite clearly that they're going to accept the same language. But in general, you cannot come with, up with an algorithm that will compare the functionality of two programs. If you do come up with such an algorithm, it will not always halt, so therefore it's not really an algorithm. Here's our language, the equivalence of two Turing machines. And we want to prove that this language is undecidable, that this problem uh, is undecidable. Given two Turing machines, we can't tell whether they are equivalent. That is, we cannot decide whether their languages are the same. And our proof approach is going to be similar, but this time we're going to reduce the emptiness problem for Turing machines to the equivalence problem for Turing machines. Remember before we were reducing the acceptance problem for Turing machines to something. And so now uh, we're, we're, doing some, we're reducing a different problem that's already known to be undecidable. In our previous video we showed that the emptiness test for Turing machines is undecidable. So we already know that ETM is undecidable we're going to reduce that to EQTM and show that that is undecidable as a result. So um, here's what we're doing. Uh, we can use this symbol uh, to mean mapping reducible. So we can reduce the acceptance problem of Turing machines into the emptiness problem of Turing machines. That's what we did in the previous video to prove that ETM was undecidable. Now, in this proof, we're going to uh, reduce ETM to EQTM. So there's a sort of transitivity thing going on here. Um, and we use this symbol for mapping reducibility. It means we can perform the transformation of one problem into another. And this transformation has to be done using a computable algorithm. Remember what we said a computable algorithm was. It's an algorithm that can be executed by a Turing machine that always halts. 
So let's be careful about the logic of this proof. Um, we want to show that EQTM is undecidable. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to assume that we have a decider, that we have R, which is an algorithm to decide the equivalence of two Turing machines. And we're going to show that if we did have that, we could construct a decider for the emptiness test of two Turing machines. That's S. But we know that ETM is undecidable, so S can't exist. So given an algorithm to solve or to decide EQTM, we're going to construct a decider for ETM. So to test whether uh, a Turing machine accepts uh, anything at all, um, the algorithm S would take as input a description of a Turing machine and then that algorithm will decide whether the language accepted by that Turing machine is empty or not. So here's what we're going here's, here's our approach. We could create a Turing machine that always rejects everything. Okay, we'll call that one M0. So let M0 be a Turing machine that always rejects any input. In fact, here's the entire Turing machine right here. It has one state. It's a reject state. That's also the initial state. The transition function is, is empty because there no, there's only one uh, state in the whole machine. So clearly whatever's on the tape is completely ignored and this thing just rejects instantly. Okay, so M0 is a very small, short, sweet Turing machine that rejects everything. And its language is clearly the empty set. Okay? So, algorithm S takes a Turing machine or the description of a Turing machine on its tape and has to either accept or not. So, what we're going to do is um, assume that M is on the tape and then write a description of M0 directly after that. And then we've got an algorithm R, okay, to decide whether uh, two Turing machines are equivalent, okay, so that algorithm is, a tour, is, is itself a Turing machine, and so now we've got a description of M on the tape followed by a description of M0 on the tape, and so we can run algorithm R on the tape to decide whether those two Turing machines are equal. Okay, so just to repeat what we've done, we wanted to show that the equivalence of two Turing machines is an undecidable problem. And we did it by assuming that we had an equivalence tester, okay, which we called R. And from R, we constructed an algorithm S to decide the emptiness test for Turing machines. But we know that we can't have a decider for that, and so therefore R couldn't possibly exist. These algorithms, I called them algorithms in, in the previous videos, R and S, but remember an algorithm is represented by a Turing machine, so it's a little bit confusing. This proof here makes the Turing machines, uh, the algorithms look a little bit more like Turing machines because it uh, talks about uh, the, what's on the tape for algorithm S. So we've just uh, shown that we can't compare two algorithms to see whether they do the same thing or not. And this has some implications uh, in the world of uh, proving programs to be correct, and I wanted to kind of make the connection there. So in this slide I have my very uh, short introduction to software engineering. Um, which uh, is that uh, to write a program you start with an idea of what you want the program to do, you then write down some sort of a f specification for what the program should do, and then from that specification you create uh, some code in your favorite programming language like Java or C or whatever. Okay, so let me, let me talk a little bit more about that. What the program is supposed to do the, is oftentimes informal and uh, you might uh, uh, have to meet with a bunch of people and uh, sort of hear the different requirements and so on. Or uh, it's, it's, it's informal and 
figuring out what it should do is 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 very nebulous um, but the idea is you can make it formal and turn it into a formal specification and here I am uh, suggesting that we might want to use something like uh, first order predicate logic to make dis uh, statements about what the program should do uh, or we might have some sort of a formal specification language the idea is that at this level the specification for what the program is supposed to do is precise, unambiguous, and perhaps even uh, can be checked in some way or other by a computer. Going from um, the idea of what the program should do uh, to a formal specification is um, a fuzzy topic. Uh, I just put subject to human error, perhaps it's an art form, uh, we can't really address it in a formal math class like this. Um, but once we've got a formal specification in some sort of a precise, unambiguous language, then we can talk about going to a program. Okay, We can express the algorithm in uh, some language, uh, C, Java, or whatever your favorite language is. And maybe that uh, programming language um, can be verified somehow. Certainly we can run it through a compiler to see that it passes certain checks. Um, and uh, we might want to ask whether the code is correct or not, whether it loops. But those are uh, tricky questions. But what I want to focus on is that both the formal specification and the algorithm expresses code are both in some sense specifications for functions or for algorithms and you're really comparing to and so you'd like to make sure that the code does what the formal specification says it's supposed to do or we might want to make sure we might want to derive a formal specification from the actual code but what we've just seen is comparing to um, different algorithms um, to see whether they do the same thing is undecidable in general. And so the formal verification that this code matches this specification is in general going to be undecidable. Okay? That doesn't mean that you can't do it in many cases. In some cases you can see that the code definitely doesn't meet the specifications or it may be that you can prove that the code does meet the specification. It may be by searching you can find a proof that the code is really meeting the specification accurately. But just because you can prove that some code meets the specification in some cases doesn't mean that you can automate that process because in general it's undecidable. Well regardless of whether the equivalence problem of Turing machines is decidable or not we still have the practical problem of writing programs and making sure that they they work properly. Uh, I mean after all you've got to write programs to uh, run the flight control uh, software for uh, airplanes and to control nuclear power plants and so on. It's very important that those programs work correctly. So here's another approach to getting the programs right and making sure they're right. Um, in this idea uh, you have two different teams and they work independently uh, from one another and the idea is that the first team will look at the specification if it's a formal specification or they might um, look at the informal specification of what the program is supposed to do and write code to implement um, the functionality that's required. Meanwhile a separate team which is uh, you know uh, working independently is a, it does exactly the same thing. They look at the specification, formal or informal, and they come up with their own implementation of the program. So you're duplicating the work. And the idea is you compare these two to make sure they're doing the same thing. Make sure these two different implementations do the same thing. And uh, uh, so ideally we'd like to prove that these two algorithms are equivalent. Um, but as, as we've seen in comparing algorithms uh, the problem is undecidable so 
we can't automate that task in all cases. Um, instead, what we do is we try to prove that they, these two implementations are identical. We try to prove that these two programs are equivalent and do the same thing. And to find a proof, we have a problem, a search problem, so we have to possibly use human guidance to direct the search. There are some uh, proof systems that can wander around looking for proofs. Um, of course, they can't always find them if they exist because of this undecidable problem. Um, but um, looking for a proof that these two implementations are identical can itself be quite useful. Um, if you can f prove that they're identical, then that's great. If you have trouble proving that they're identical, then it may be that uh, they aren't identical. And in the course of creating a proof, either a proof that the code implements a formal specification or that one implementation is equal to another implementation, if you have problems in finding a proof, it could indicate that um, the proof doesn't exist because they're not there, or it might also um, uncover ambiguities or uncertainties in the specification. Uh, and if the specification is not formal, it may also uncover lack of detail in the specification. So the process of looking for the proof, uh, either that the two implementations are equal or that the implementation matches the specification, the process of looking for that proof is a useful exercise uh, in its own right.